to Cumberland Community Church. Those of you who are watching this on the live stream, those of you who have chosen to come and join us today, we are blessed to be together. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good, isn't he? All the time he's good. And uh, as we look at what's going on in the world around us today, it just seems like there's no end to whatever might happen that's just going to cause grief and stress and hurt to people. So let's stop and pray this morning before we get started. We're glad that you've chosen to join us by live stream or in person, and we just want God to bless us and protect us and watch over us and help us to become everything that he wants us to be. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your amazing love and for your grace and for your mercy. God, we pray that you would be amongst us today. Your word says that wherever two or three of us are gathered, whether it's in person or whether it's on live stream, that you're there. And Lord, I pray that as we sing songs to you that honor you and glorify you as we Lift our hearts in praise to you, God, as we open your word to see what it says about how we should live our lives in times like this. Father, that we would not only be a blessing to each other, but that we would be a blessing to you. Lord, I pray that your will would be done in this place. I ask that you would touch someone's heart today. Lord, if there's somebody in this room that's really been struggling, maybe with fear or what's going on, maybe with worry about their job or what might not be a job when they're ready to go back to a job, Father, whatever whatever might be somebody's burden today father i pray that you would help them to lay their burdens at your feet as they lay their hearts in front of you and allow you to bring healing and comfort to them 
Father, we know that your word says that you want to comfort us. We know that you know when we're stressed and when we cry, your word says that you collect all of our tears in your bottle. And God, I pray that as we think about our hope in you, as we understand that Jesus is alive, and as we sing all these songs, God, about how you lift burdens off of us and how you give us hope for tomorrow, that God, somebody who maybe was struggling with their hope when they walked in today would have not only hope when they walk out the door, but joy in knowing that you will never leave us, you will never abandon us, that you always provide for us, and God, we can trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll let you sit down, and we'll move on to see what God's Word has for us today. Father God, thank you for these songs of hope, and these songs of deliverance, and these songs of promise that you've allowed us to sing this morning. God, I pray in Jesus' name that as we transition from praising and honoring and glorifying you through singing songs, that we would be touched deeply, God, by your word as we read it, as we understand who Jesus was in the, in the circumstances that he found himself, and Father, how we should live our lives in the midst of being sojourners in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Have a seat. <laughs> If you have your Bible with you this morning, you're going to want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, and then you're going to want to turn to James chapter 4, and put a marker in there, put your finger in there, so you can follow along with us. But we're going to start in Philippians chapter 2, and as we start this morning, I want to talk to you about the fact that, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that affect us during this time in which we find ourselves. And there are a lot of broken people out there right now. Anybody understand that? There are a lot of broken people, and the longer this goes, the more broken they're going to be. Not only broken spiritually and emotionally, but broken physically and broken financially. The longer things like this drag out, the more worried people get, the more they act out. We notice that's going on right now in our world. As you see what's going on in Minneapolis and L.A., as you see what's going on in Washington, D.C. By the way, pray for Brad Greeley because he got called out to go down there last night for to control all that and help control all that mess. Um, you know, we've got people standing in harm's way dealing with folks down there that just don't have anything else to do. They've got too much time on their hands. Some of them may be being paid to do what they're doing. But, you know, we, we live in a world today where everything just seems to be topsy-turvy. The devil is trying to stir it up everywhere he can. And it just causes more brokenness. It never helps anything. I mean, when people are out there destroying other people's livelihoods, which have nothing to do with the situation that's going on, that's a terrible thing. I was reading, I was reading an article about a, an ex-fireman up there in Minneapolis. He saved all his retirement money. He opened his own little business up. He was getting ready to really get going with it, and all of a sudden those riots broke out, and they burned his building to the ground. He lost it all. He lost everything. He lost his whole retirement right there in that building as he watched it burn to the ground. And so, you know, we, we're lucky. We're kind of insulated here in the mountains, aren't we? That, I, I'm glad, you know. Somebody, I used to tell everybody when I was younger, I said, I don't know, it's 20 years behind everything else. That ain't a bad thing right now. You know, 20 years behind ain't a bad thing right now. I don't want to be involved in what's going on out there and what's, what the craziness is that's going on. People just tear things up just because they can. And there's nothing that can be done about it, right? The police aren't arresting anybody. Isn't it convenient? Isn't it convenient that everybody that's out there looking is wearing a mask? Isn't that convenient? Nobody can do facial recognition. They don't know who they are because they're, they're at least being corona-proof. They're wearing their mask out there to cause all their mischief. So, you know, as we think about that, those people don't care about anybody who's being broken what they're, by what they're doing. And a lot of people who live where there's not a lot of problems don't worry about other people that are broken either. And that's one thing I love about our church. We care about each other. We watch over after each other and we help each other. And that's the way it ought to be, right? Isn't that what God's people are supposed to do? Love each other, care about each other, especially in times of brokenness. Now, if you look at the title up here, Split Personalities and Doorways. Wow, what are we going to talk about today? Hmm, I wonder. Well, open up your Bible if you would. Now, the first thing I want to say, statement I want to make, is that unlike some modern religious leaders and your TV preachers and stuff like that, <laughs> Jesus never used his power to show off. He didn't. If you'll remember, the marriage 
at Cana of Galilee when Jesus did his very first miracle. He wasn't ready to show off, right? His mom came up and said, hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. You should help them out. He says, my time has not yet come. He wasn't going to jump out on the screen and say that he was somebody that he's not. You know, he knew who he was, and he, he was just not ready to reveal that. And as we think about it, Jesus sometimes very quietly and very humbly did what he did. And other times he was forced to be out in front of people to perform the miracles that he performed. But one of the things that he always said was, I didn't come here to prove to you anything. I came to seek and save that which was lost. I came to heal the broken. And if you look at who Jesus hung out with, it wasn't the real popular crowd, was it? It was lepers and prostitutes and broken people and, and sinners. And sometimes, when I think about the church in America today, those people are excluded. They're not invited in. Jesus invited them all in. As a matter of fact, he went and ate it at uh, Matthew's house. Matthew was what? Does anybody remember? A tax collector, the most hated person, like I'm inviting the IRS agent over for dinner, right? Uh, nobody wants to eat with the IRS because he's going to look at your silverware and see if it's expensive enough for you to be lying on your tax form, right? But as we think about it and we look at it, Jesus never tried to impress people. But the amazing thing was he didn't have to. If you watch Jesus' life, the people would sit around and say, he talks like no one else talked before. He doesn't rely on somebody else's opinion he just speaks what he believes what he says and it's powerful so as we think about jesus and we look at that he modeled the brokenness that god required for sin to be removed he modeled the brokenness anybody remember what happened in the garden of gethsemane he got down on his face before god and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and it said that he prayed so hard that the capillaries under his skin were breaking and the sweat that he was sweating as he was praying was running in the middle of that and it was dripping on the ground, which was just a picture of what was going to happen to him in just a little while. And Jesus had people who wanted to follow him. And what did he say? Birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He didn't have a big fancy house. He didn't drive big fancy carts with mules on him. He didn't do any of that kind of stuff. He was humble. And he came to earth. To be like us. Isn't that amazing? That our God would come to earth to be like us so that he could understand the stuff that we go through. When you're struggling, Jesus knows what it means to struggle. When you're heartbroken, you remember the story of Jesus at Lazarus' tomb, right? He showed up, all the people were just weeping like they had no hope. And he showed up and he called Lazarus forth out of the grave. But in the, before he did that, the shortest verse in the Bible is found right there. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He truly loved Lazarus. He truly loved Mary and Martha. He truly loved people. And he wept when he saw their unwillingness to believe that God was bigger, better, faster, stronger, or could take care of the problem. Right? So let's, uh, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and see that Jesus humbled himself before the Father. Even though he was equal with God the Father, he humbled himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ? Is there? Amen. Is there encouragement for belonging to Christ? Yes, there is. Any comfort from his love? Yes. Have you ever had one of those days when the only thing that got you through was the fact that you knew Jesus was holding on to you? Yes. Have you ever had one of those days? <laughs> yes. Any fellowship together in the Spirit? That's what we're doing right now, right? Fellowshipping together in the Spirit. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Boy, I tell you what, you can go through a lot of churches and ask them that question, and you got that old person there that says, Yeah, my heart's tender and compassionate. <laughs> sure it is. Right? Look like they've been sucking on lemons. and ain't compassionate about anybody. But let something happen to them, and what do they do? They want everybody to show up. But we should be tenderhearted and compassionate, shouldn't we? That means we care about each other. We love each other. We belong to each other. Every one of us matters. It says here, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other and loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. You find me a church like that, and I'll find you a church that's making a difference for God's kingdom. But what usually happens? Opinions are like belly buttons in churches. Everybody's got one. Some are innies and some are outies, and most people don't care what you got. But it says here that if we truly love each other, we agree with each other, 
then we can work together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. How about that? That means nobody can be a legend in their own mind and be okay with God. I didn't say a legend in their own time. I said a legend in their own mind. Right? Listen, I would, the last two weeks, we went up to Morgantown to go to <laughs> we went to Sam's Club up there. And as we're checking out, this young, tall boy, I'd look up to look at him. He was that tall. And he had this nice little thin, scraggly beard. You know, he looked at me and said, Your beard is legendary. <laughs> And then yesterday, I had somebody on Facebook, day four yesterday on Facebook, I had somebody tell me my beard was epic. So I could walk around, pat myself on the back, if I could actually get my arm around my back, and pat myself on the back and say, wow, I have a legendary epic beard. <laughs> no, it's just a big old white fuzzy beard. That's all it is. Not legendary, not epic, right? There are a lot of people out there who have bigger beards than mine, thicker beards than mine, better looking beards than mine. I don't let that kind of stuff get to me. But as we think about it, there are many people out there who are selfish, and they strut around like the peacock. They got their feathers all out, you know, women got the war paint on, <laughs> guys got the hair comb right, driving in a truck that they got to have a ladder to climb in because it's that high off the ground, walk, and they, you can just barely see their head over the steering wheel. <laughs> you know, why do we do that kind of stuff? Why do we try to make ourselves more than what we are? Why do we? Jesus never did that. He never did. I mean, they wanted to make him king, and he said no. He knew he was already king. He's coming back as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords one of these days. But it was not time for him to be the king. He could have took over with a word. He could have wiped them all out. He could have come down off that cross. Could have called 10,000 angels down. But he didn't do that, did he? No. He was kind, tenderhearted. He loved people. He even helped people he wasn't supposed to talk to, like the woman at the well, the, the, the centurion, and all those people that had the daughter that was sick. He talked to all of those folks. It says, be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You know, we need to be calling and talking to each other, texting each other, loving on each other. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? Many of you are friends on Facebook. Many of you talked on Facebook. But you know, I'm telling you, just like when we were only live streaming and we weren't meeting together for church, it's not the same talking to somebody on a text message, talking to somebody on Facebook, when you're just putting words in there as it is actually being in their presence, right? Yeah. It's a whole lot different when you can interact with somebody. That's what we were made for. We were made to interact. And I'm going to go by what the Bible says. Hebrews 10, 23, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Right? Anybody agree with that? You must. You would be here. Right? And you wouldn't be watching on live on, on Facebook. We need to be with God's people, whether we're in person or whether we're not. Verse 5, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Why is that? Because Jesus ascended back to heaven. And the only example of Christ that some people in this earth are going to see is you. If you don't have the attitude that Jesus had, they're not going to have a very good impression of who Jesus is, are they? No. If you're selfish, if you're ambitious, if you've got to be the, the, the center of attention all the time, that's not who Jesus was. Jesus walked along and people just started following him. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is if you're going along and you look back over your shoulder and nobody's following you, you're not a leader. Correct? Remember playing when you were a kid, follow the leader? We're following the leader, the leader, the leader, following the leader, wherever he may go. Anybody remember that from being a kid? You just go under this and over that and around this and everywhere else. And Jesus just walked and he told God's truth and people followed him. And it changed their lives. And because of that, we have hope today. Because of that, we can be for Christ and not be ashamed of being for Christ. All right, let's look at what it says here in verse 6. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, it wasn't the most important thing for him to walk around saying, Yep, I'm God. I'm God. Yes, I'm God. You better do what I say, because I brought you into this world and I can take you out. That sounds like mom, doesn't it? <laughs> he didn't do that. He didn't want anybody to expose who he was until he was ready to expose who he was. 
And then he started saying stuff like this. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. And what we ought to be able to walk around and do is, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus Christ. Because I'm one with Jesus. He humbled himself. He made himself like us. Though he was God, he did not think the quality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He was still God, but he set some of his divine privileges aside. In other words, he chose not to know some things on purpose. And somebody would say, no way. No way. I got in an argument with a college professor about this. I was sharing it with the guys at the Bible study the other night. I had a college professor. He wanted, he'd say something, and I just couldn't take it anymore, so I said, that's not right. And they go, never, never, never should you challenge authority, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're telling everybody and teaching everybody out there today. Don't challenge authority. They know what's right. And he said, Jesus never set aside anything. And I took him to that passage where it says, Jesus set aside his divine privilege. Okay? And I said, Jesus chose not to know some things. He said, that's not possible. I said, turn to Matthew 24, 36. And the whole class is there now. They got bated breath. They're waiting to see what's going on. Because there's the authority and there's me, a student. Now, I'm not like all these other students. They're all 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And I was, on, I was already 30. I'm not one of those people where you step on my foot and the top of my head flips open and you just pour the garbage you want me to know in there and slam the lid shut and hope I'll puke it back to you. That's not who I am. And so I said, turn to Matthew 24, 36. Oh, you know what? Don't, don't even bother. I'll just quote it for you. I said, the disciples in, in Matthew 24 want to know when Jesus is coming back. They want to know when the end of the world is going to be, right? In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says this. He says, of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the Son, only the Father knows. And I just looked at that professor and I said, did Jesus just lie? He called me a couple days later and says, one of us has got to be out of this class. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll be at class tomorrow night. And you know what? He didn't show up. The, dude, the dean of students came and taught the rest of that class while I was in there. Same way as what's going on in the world today. Just because somebody says so, doesn't mean so. God gave us all common sense and he gave us all brains. We don't need a mind telling us what to do when we're around adults, do we? We don't. We ought to do what's right, what makes sense, what's safe and healthy for everybody. But we shouldn't be scared and we shouldn't do things that we know we don't need to do. He took the humble position of a slave. Do you see that? He was born as a human being, and when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, his Father, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Do you know that God didn't determine that an angel should be sacrificed for us? No angel can be sacrificed for us because the angels aren't going to receive salvation. No mere human being could be sacrificed for our sins. And we can't do enough good things to earn God's favor. Jesus had to come. He had to take on human form. He had to die on the cross so our sins can be forgiven. That's the only way it happens. You can't be a good enough person. You can't earn the salvation. Jesus humbled himself. He left heaven. He felt the pain. He went through everything that, we go, that he went through. He felt all the things that we felt. Joy, sorrow, sadness, happiness. All those things. He struggled with people who betrayed him. And yet he still laid his life down. So that we could be forgiven. Isn't that an amazing Savior? An amazing, amazing God. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him a name above all other names. The Bible says that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord, right? The, the name above all names, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow every, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if Jesus was broken as a human being, and he humbled himself before the Father in order to be right with his Father, what makes any person think they should not do the same thing? Have you ever met anybody that says, I'm a Christian? But if you see their picture, they might be down there looting in D.C. or looting up Minneapolis. Huh? 
They grew up in church, and their mom just knows they got saved, but they're out there stealing and burning buildings down, don't belong to them, causing all kinds of problems. You see, people get too quickly given the opportunity to say, oh, I'm a Christian, and everything else is, is gone from that. They, they, everybody just believes it. They gave them a pass. Here's my theory. The proof is in the pudding. If you're a true follower of Christ, you're going to live like Jesus lived. You're going to live a life for Him. You're going to live a life that includes Him. You're going to talk about Him. You're going to read God's Word. You're going to share about it. In times like this, when people need Jesus, all the people who belong to Jesus are the ones who should be telling about Jesus, right? Everybody else is looking at the newspaper. Hey, you know what? They said if only this many don't die, we can go ahead and go back to doing this. If they don't have any more cases, guess what? You know why I have more cases? Because they're doing more testing. There's going to be more cases. They're just looking for a reason to keep you at home. No, I, I trust in God. I believe in Him. I know that He's got my back. I know that He walks in front of me, clearing the path. I know He walks beside me because when I fall down, He picks me up. And I know He's got my back too. Right? God's going to take care of us. And this thing, they're never going to eradicate it. It's always going to be around, just like every other cold that's ever been around. And I don't have to worry about it. But you know what? I'm humble enough to know that if God wants me to have it, that's His will for my life, and He's going to get me through it one way or another. Because if I don't get through it here, I get to be with Him! And if I get through it here, I get to tell people that out. He walked right beside me and He took care of me. Right? Everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay. Well, brokenness is the doorway to the Father's heart. That's where we come up with brokenness in the title of this sermon. Brokenness is the doorway to God's heart. Jesus didn't come for people who thought they were okay. He didn't come for people who knew they were right. He came for people who needed God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness. And if you would uh, look at me with Psalm, uh, I'm going to read to you, Psalm 51, 16 through 17 says, You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh Lord. You hear that? You can put all the money you want in the offering basket, and you ought to do that. You can put all kinds of stuff that in the youth group or in the children's ministry, in the men's ministry. You can help here and help there and help here and do that. And you know, there are a lot of people who have name tags on everything in the church. You ever been in one of those churches? Got the little brass name tags where everybody's name is on the church somewhere. In some churches, they even have a pew with their name on it. Don't you sit in their seat, though. Woo! Man, they will not be like Jesus. They'll just stand there tapping their foot. First shall be last, and the last shall be first. Get out of my seat. Right? As we think about that, all the recognition we get here on earth is all the recognition we get. But when we do what we do for the cause of Christ, the Bible says there will be rewards for us in heaven. When we do what we do to be seen by man, it doesn't help. God wants us to have a broken heart when we come to Him. He wants us to truly understand how bad off we are without Him. And then, when we receive His grace and His mercy, it helps us to move from brokenness to breakthrough. That's what we're talking about, right? In this sermon series, moving from brokenness to breakthrough. Moving from I can't fix me, and that's the very first step of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't fix me. Try as I might, I still keep falling down. I'm like the proverbial pig that goes back to the mud puddle. But when Jesus is watching over me, when Jesus is my focus, when Jesus is the one who gives me strength, then I'm able to do what God wants me to do. Okay? So our hearts get out of tune with God sometimes, don't they? You ever have your heart get out of tune with God? But life goes on. It's kind of like when we're singing up here. We practice and we practice and we practice. But sometimes it gets away from us. And you can't just stop the soundtrack. It just keeps right on going, doesn't it? Have you ever seen anybody that played music, like on a piano or something like that, and you go up to them and say, that was the best thing I've ever heard. And they're like, yeah, but I made a mistake here, and I made a mistake here, and I made a mistake here. Well, nobody heard it. Nobody saw it. And guess what? Unless they can do it better than you do, they should keep their mouth shut. Right? Any agree? agree? Sure. Have you ever had anybody try to take something to do something that they've never done before, but they know how they can do it better than you? <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. It doesn't take long to figure out that they're blowing smoke, right? And so as we think about God and we think about who Jesus was, God wants us to recognize that He's God 
and we're not. That he's all powerful and we're weak. But you know one of the things that I've learned? That when I recognize how weak I am, then I begin to know how strong he is and I begin to ask him for strength. So when I'm broken, God gives me strength. When I need healing, God gives me healing. When I need hope, God gives me hope. When I, need, when I don't know the answer, the Bible says that I ask God and he'll give me an answer. And I better take his answer. Don't just be playing games with it. And that's the true idea of moving from brokenness to breakthrough. You realize that God is the only answer for no matter what situation you face, no matter what you deal with. Okay? Now, we begin to live a double life with a split personality sometimes once we start cruising away from God, don't we? We still know the words. We still know how to act in front of people. But sometimes when nobody else is around, we uh, fall back to the old style of living. Or sometimes we quit going to church. Or sometimes we quit doing what we know we should and we go back to doing what we know we shouldn't do. And here's the deal. If you truly belong to Christ, you can't stay there. Because the Holy Spirit won't allow you. The Holy Spirit is always going to be pecking on your shoulder. And sometimes getting a two-by-four out and wrapping you up alongside the head to get you to remember who you belong to. Right? And here's one of the things that I tell people who struggle. It's a whole lot easier to be who you were than who you are. Right? Especially for people who didn't accept Christ when they were little kids. Who didn't ask for forgiveness. It's a whole lot easier to go to your default setting. Well, I want my default setting to be living like Jesus lived. I want a new default setting, don't you? I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to live the way he wants me to live because I want to live in the breakthrough. I don't want to go back to the brokenness. How many of you would like to go back to the brokenness that you experienced before Jesus? How many of you are glad there's breakthrough and Jesus is the one who gets you where you need to go? Yeah, right? He changes us. He gives us a brand new start. Now, as I said earlier, go and turn to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to finish up today. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Let's get there. Yes, these are real Bible pages turning for those of you who are listening in. Um, so let's think about it. Performance is a combination of Christian words without the presence of Jesus. Would you agree with that? It is a combination of Christian words without the presence of Jesus. I talk to college students about this all the time. If somebody says they're a Christian, just because they want to date you, you better take your time, go slowly, and watch and see who they are. If they don't want to pray, if they don't want to read the Bible, if they don't want to go to church, chances are they are not a Christian. They just know Christian words. And can I help everybody realize something on live stream and here today? Just because you're born in America and you drive a Chevrolet and you like apple pie, that doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you sit in a church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because your grandma was a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. The only thing that makes you a Christian is to humble yourself with a broken spirit and to cry out to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and to give you a new start and new hope because he's forgiven your sins. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. That's the answer. That's the answer. Anybody who can talk it but not walk it doesn't own it. Right? I ask fellow students all the time. Quote me your favorite scripture verse. I ask other people, quote me a scripture verse. Well, I don't have any memorized. Well, how long do you say you've been a Christian? Isn't part of being a follower of Christ, memorizing God's word and making part of who you are? But it's too easy now, right? You got it in the book. You get it on your phone. You can get it on the computer. You can get it wherever you want it. But you need it in your heart. And the only way you can get it to where you can keep it and make it part of who you are is to memorize it. And God's Word never changes. And God's Word always gives us strength. Doesn't it? Hello? <laughs> Anybody home? Okay. There's a disconnect sometimes with what I present and who I am. Would you agree with that? There's a disconnect. If you can hang out with people that you know and love and never bring in Jesus into the conversation, that's a disconnect. You want to be a, presented as a Christian, but if you never open your mouth, how are they going to know it? But I'll tell you what, if you do happen to step back in it, you know what I mean, step in it? Yeah. And they see that, they'll point that out for you, won't they? Anybody ever somebody do that for you? 
You step in, they point, oh, I thought you were this great, big, fancy Christian. I thought you, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, right? Well, I make mistakes, and there's been a lot of times in my life where I've had to apologize to somebody in front of somebody and say, you know what, that is not what I should have done. That is not what Jesus wanted for me. I apologize to you. I'm not perfect, and that's not an excuse. I fall. Yes, I do. But thank God I can get forgiveness for it, right? And if we lived our lives in front of people like that so they knew who we were and what we were doing, it'd make a huge difference. Let's look at verses 1 through 6 here in James. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come out from evil desires and war with you, within you? You want what you do not have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Isn't that what's going on in the world out there right now with all these riots? Sure it is. People just don't know how to do what they're supposed to do. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Do you hear that? My God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. Correct? Just because somebody else has something doesn't mean I need it. Maybe God knows that I shouldn't have it because it might not be good for me. Have you ever thought about that once in a while? Hmm. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. There's a whole strand of Christianity out there that says all you should ask God for is what gives you pleasure. Well, if you don't know what, a bad day is like you can't understand what a good day is, correct? If you don't know what it is to do without, you don't appreciate what you have, correct? I talk to people all the time. They don't understand what it means to do without. They've never had to struggle in the world in which they find themselves. And so... As we think about this, we have to check our motives, don't we? Um, we have to have the right intent and the right motive. Look at what it says here in verse 4. This is talking to the church. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Here's where we're talking about the split personality thing. The Bible says that if we are just as comfortable doing what everybody else is doing in the world good, bad, or indifferent, as we are, as what we say we are with what God wants, there's a, a split personality in us, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of thing, right? We are in the world, but we should not be of the world. We shouldn't be doing all the filthy things the world does. We shouldn't, you know, we should be speaking out against what's going on in the world. And there are not enough people who are speaking out against what's going on, because we're afraid to talk about the fact that those people down there that are destroying businesses and destroying other people's livelihoods, they're not doing that because of some guy who got killed in Minneapolis. They're doing it because they can, and they know that because of the heightened tensions between races and things like that in our country today, nobody's going to do anything about it because the finger's going to get pointed at them. Right? See, nobody wants to talk about that stuff. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that sin is sin, and you can't justify one sin because of another sin. You cannot do it. The Bible says don't compare yourself to someone else. Do what you're supposed to. Then you'll have the satisfaction of doing your best. What's going on in our world today is not the best. It's not. It's far cry from being the best. It's sheer ugliness and evil turned loose on mostly innocent people who had nothing to do with what's going on, right? And when you have 20% unemployment right now, and you have 20 million people, almost 40 million people now that are out of work, and they're just sitting around on their hands and they got nothing to do. And somebody waves a couple bucks under their nose and says, Hey, come on, let's go do this. We're going to make some, we're going to raise rocks. They'll show up. Correct? Never should a Christian be involved in anything like that. Never should a Christian be involved in making racial slurs on, on the computer, on Facebook, or any other place. Never should a Christian person be down or degrading or downgrading somebody else. Because, but for the grace of God, we're all on our way to hell. And those of us who have accepted Christ have hope, and some people don't have hope, and they don't know about Jesus. And we need to help them understand that there is a God who loves them. But you can't pretend to be a Christian just when you're sitting in the church and sit out there and root and do what everybody else is doing when you're not in church. That's a sign of a split personality, isn't it? If you act one way around one group of people and you act another way around another group of people, that's a split personality. That's a problem. It's also called fakery. And it's lies, and it's hypocritical. Isn't it? And we don't need to have split personality. I need to know who I am in Christ. 
I need to live my life like he's the most important thing. Because he is, isn't he? Isn't Jesus the most important thing? Sure he is. Well, we have to choose who we're going to follow as we do this. It says here, I say it again, if you want to be a friend with the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. Faithful to him. If you have Christ, the Bible says you have the Holy Spirit. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says when we, when we confess our sins and turn our lives over and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that he gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal that the work he started, he's going to finish. Does that make sense? And the Holy Spirit comes to help us understand God's work, to teach us what's right, to help us live for God, to help us understand what God wants. And anybody who can live without a conscience, even though they claim to be a Christian, anybody who can do all the ugly things they do, you know, hold resentment and grudges and bitterness like we talked about last week and all that kind of stuff, you got to check and see if you really belong to God because the Holy Spirit can't live where that's going on. So as we think about it, there are many people in our world today who need to move from brokenness to breakthrough. Don't they? There are many people in God's church across this world that need to move from brokenness to breakthrough. They're broken and they don't realize they're broken. Some of them have been broken for so long they think that's just normal. You know, there's a word that I hate nowadays. Normal. You know, ah, the world has never been normal. Has it? And the new normal ain't going to be normal either. Is it? It's not. There are just some words that just jump out and, and just make you want to Right? Anybody besides me? Put your hand up. I'm tired of it. Right? I'm tired to death of it. It just causes separation. It causes people to be against one another. And that's not what God wants. He wants us to come together, doesn't he? He wants us to work together, to love each other, and care for each other. Now, when we started doing this, we said, if you're sick, stay at home. Right? If you're an uncomfortable person, stay home. We're on Facebook. You can watch it. And there are other people who work in the health field who need to do what they do because of their job, and that's fine. We're okay with that. But here's the deal. We've chosen to let responsible people make responsible decisions for their own responsible self. I'm, not, I'm nobody's mommy. Wouldn't I make a pretty mommy? <laughs> mm, don't I make a pretty mommy with my long gray beard? My epic legendary long gray beard, right? I was sitting with a guy yesterday pumping gas in my truck over at the Mount Near Mart on 28. And he said, he puts the pump in and he gets out and he says, do you think this thing's going slow? He said, I've been sitting here for a couple minutes and I only got two gallons of gas in my car. I said, yeah, we stay here long enough to get a long gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> See you are awake. God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him, right? And he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Who brought grace to us? Jesus did, because he humbled himself on the cross. That's where we understand grace. We see him laying down his lives. While we were his enemies, Christ died for us. While we were on our way to hell, Christ died for us. God so wanted a relationship with us that he made the sacrifice. He offered the opportunity for us to know him and to believe in him and to experience all the great things that he has for us. He gave us the opportunity to move from brokenness to breakthrough. You see, there's nobody beyond God's reach. Nobody. The person you know that's living the farthest away from God, if they'll open their hearts and their minds at some point and hear what God's love and grace and mercy is about, they can be changed. They can find out how great his love is. Well, let's look at verses 7 through 10. Um, in God's plan for us, our inner and outer lives have to match. Don't they? You ever hear the saying, walk the walk and talk the talk? Too many people talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. And what comes out of them is different than what they say they are. And we, don't, we can't live that way. We just can't. Look at verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. Is that a suggestion? No. When somebody says, do this, what is it? 
It's a directive. It's a command. Humble yourselves before the Lord. How do you do that? You recognize who God is. And you recognize that you're not smarter than Him. You're not stronger than Him. You don't have answers like He's got. You just don't. And it says before and after that, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let me tell you, most of the time the devil didn't make you do it. He chose to do it. There might have been some instigation from the devil. There might have been some suggestion from those powers and principalities that we're at war with every day. But let me tell you, it's what's on the inside of the person that comes out that demonstrates who they are. Isn't it? Have you ever met somebody who's just angry all the time? That was their only, that was their default setting, angry. Somebody who lies about everything. That's their default setting. You see, it's what's inside of us that we haven't given to God that defines who we are and demonstrates who we are. Correct? But we try to live like it's something else, so we're living in that split personality world. We're pretending to be one thing when in fact we're something else. God wants us to turn our lives over to Him so that He can make us who He wants us to be. And God's will for our lives, when we get in tune with it, and you start living the way God wants you to live, you will find out that when obstacles come, there's no way your joy can be taken away. When hard times come, there's no way that you're going to give up. When things don't go your way, you're not going to stand there with your lips sticking out like a little kid. Until God gives you what you want. Because God's not here to give you what you want. He's not here to even make you happy. What's he here for? To make you holy, right? Because he says, you be holy. Because I'm holy. And that's what God wants. So not only do we need to humble ourselves before God and resist the devil, uh, because it makes him go away, we need to come close to God. And he will come close to us. You all who come to Cumberland Community Church, all the time that you've been here, you've seen me illustrate this more than once. If you take one step toward God, he takes all the steps that are in between you and him, and he comes right to you. Isn't that amazing? And if I turn my back and I start walking away from God because I got out of tune with God, all I got to do is turn back to Him. And He's still right there because He never moved. I'm the one that moved. I'm the one that chose to live a split life. The Bible says we either belong to Him or we don't belong to Him. There's no two ways about it. You can't almost be a Christian, can you? No. no. Just like you can't almost be a sinner. You're either a sinner or you're a Christian. Okay? If you're a follower of Christ, your sins are forgiven. All the ones you ask for forgiveness for. That's why we need to go to God every day. And ask Him to forgive us for the things that we know we did. And you know what I even have to do sometimes? I have to say, God, you know, I probably did something I didn't think about today. Would you forgive me for that too? Because I don't want anything between me and God. Nothing. I want to know that when I call out to Him, there is no barrier between me and Him. I want to know when I read His Word that it's going to speak to my heart. It's not going to have to go through the sin filter that's there. And do you know what I pray for every time I get up in front of you? I pray that there would be no sin in my life that would cause you not to hear what God wants you to hear today. I don't want to preach God's Word through the filter of sin. I don't. And I'm never going to tell you, this is what it says. This is what. Because it says what it means. Doesn't it? And if it says, come close to God and He'll come close to you, that's what it means. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. You, your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Split personalities. You know, some of us need to wash our hands. That's the best thing you can do during this pandemic, isn't it? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Even though now the CDC said you can get it from the surface, then they said you couldn't get it from the surface, and enough people screamed and said, oh, you can't say that. Oh, we might get it from the surface now. So just guess what? Wash your hands. What do we tell our kids? And if they didn't wash their hands again enough, what do we tell them? Go wash them again. And if you don't wash them, I'll wash them for you. Got this little brush. Right? Clean them up. It's all good sense. It's all common sense stuff. Well... It goes on to finish and say this. Let there be tears for what you've done. You know, I talk to people all the time. And I say, tell me, how, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And they'll say, I got baptized. When? Or I started going to church. When? Mm -hmm. Some people say, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what day I got saved. It was a process. Guess what? 
The Bible says when we have sin in our life, we should be broken and contrite. There should be tears for our sin, especially if we already have a relationship with Christ. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that to go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of Christ is the same as taking the cross and wiping your feet on it. Total disregard for the sacrifice Jesus made. Now, I don't mean we're supposed to be like little kids when you catch it, right? Soon, you, you come in the room and they're doing what they're doing and they're going, What's the story? What's the story? What's the story? Why are they doing that? Because if it's in my world and my kids, they know they're in for a butt blister, right? Which we don't do enough of anymore in the world either. But crocodile tears and alligator tears are not the same as being sorry for what you did. It's just trying to get you out of work somebody's nerves or work somebody's mind and, and sympathy. You know what? You can't work that sympathy. He set it down. You either believe in him or you don't. You ask for forgiveness of your sins or you can't have it. You can't just cry your way out of it. Okay? Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. You see, a true walk with God is not a casual affair or an exercise in indifference. It's not. It is not a casual affair. It is not an exercise in indifference. It is an on-purpose walk where you try to walk, where God wants you to walk, you try to do what God wants you to do. And guess what? None of us is ever going to get it exactly right. But if we make the effort, God's going to honor the effort. Now, I don't mean what I just heard about out of Game County Public Schools. Do you know that all these kids who are doing their paperwork at home because they can't go to school because they're afraid they'll get sick? If they just make an effort, they can't be failed. They get a 70% and they pass. I guess if you put your name on the paper and answer one question, you get a 70. That's not what it's like in God's economy. God wants us to live for Him. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to do what He wants us to do. And you know what? Man's always going to compromise. Everywhere you look, there's always going to be compromise. Except when the authoritarians are setting down the rules, and if you break their rules, you know, they let people out of jail so they won't get sick, but they put people in jail for going to church because they might get sick. Isn't that amazing? That doesn't seem like it makes sense to me. How about you? Just like we need to look at the world and say, you know what? If that's what they're doing, I don't have to participate in that. And if they don't like me for not participating in that, I'm okay with that. And if somebody's doing something they shouldn't, then I walk up to them and I share the truth of God's word with them about what God says about whatever they're participating in and they don't like it and they think I'm a hater. No, all I've done is done what my job was is to tell them what God's word says about it. I don't trust in man. I don't trust in human beings. I trust in God. How many of you know that human beings will probably let you down every time? God never lets you down, does he? He's always there. He's always constant. He always cares. He's the only one who can take us from brokenness to the breakthrough that he wants us to have. From the shackles of sin to the freedom of grace. From brokenness to joy and hope. If that's not what you have in your life today, there's a disconnect, a disconnect somewhere along the way. And God wants you to just call out to him. He wants to ask you, he wants you to ask him for forgiveness. For whatever might be in between you and him that's not allowing you to experience the breakthrough that he wants you to have. I'm not going to tell you that you just confess your sins, God's going to make it all go away. You're going to have all the money you need, everything's going to go well. Nobody's going to come get your car, nobody's going to come get your house. You know, they're not going to turn your power off. I'm not going to say that. But I'm going to say that God's going to walk with you through every situation and every circumstance in your life. If you confess your sins to him, he's always going to make sure that you're taken care of. Watch this. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55, I've never seen the righteous or Satan or his seed begging for bread. God knows what you need to move you from here to there, to sustain you in the journey, and to help you once he gets you where he takes you so that you can continue to increase and move and become even more what he wants you to be. Call out to God. Confess your sins. Resist the devil. Come close to God. And he'll come close to you. Doesn't seem that hard, does it? Then why do we struggle with that? Why don't we just jump right in and say, Lord, okay, I'm ready now. 
Because we've got to think about it for a while. Here's the problem. If God's speaking to your heart now, and you don't act on what God's doing, the further, you, the, the further time moves you away from what you've heard, the easier it is for something else to come into your mind. You know, it's like that person who's getting there ready to, I'm, I'm telling you this, and square off! <laughs> you know, any little thing can divert your attention from whatever it was you were supposed to be doing. So, where you are on live stream, where you are, if there is something between you and God today that you know is holding you back from receiving the breakthrough that he wants you to have, here's the way to do it. You admit that there's a sin in your life, something. You believe that Jesus can take care of it. Confess it to him and give your life to him from today on. Whether you've looked for him before or not, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to renew your life with God. Today's the day to move to hope, joy, peace, and all those things that go along with living in breakthrough. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Lord, we thank you that you are God who opens doorways so we can walk out of our sin and who heals our split personalities as far as our love for the world versus our love for you. We also know that in this passage of Scripture, there, if we enumerated them, there were about 20 things that it said to do this, do this, do this, do this, and then we would be moving closer to you. Father, sometimes we say, I don't know what to do to fix my circumstance. I don't know how to change what's going on. I don't know why I'm in the place that I'm in. We've pretty much explained it today, God, and I pray that your Spirit would reveal to somebody in this room what it is they need to do to move from whatever brokenness they find themselves in, whether it's emotional brokenness, physical brokenness, spiritual brokenness, financial brokenness, whatever it is, that they would trust in you, believe in you, and take the steps that they need to take to allow you to be the God of the situation in which they find themselves. And Father, I pray that you would deliver them. I pray that you would give them the ability to one day stand up and praise you and honor you and glorify you because they did pray. And they asked. And they were up to remove the barriers by confessing their sins. And God, you provided exactly what they needed. Sometimes, God, we're praying for the wrong thing. And that's why we don't have what we want or what we need. We need to pray according to your will. And it's always your will for us to confess our sins. It's always your will for us to come closer to you. It's always your will to let your spirit cause us to fall in love with you more and more and more every day. So, Lord, have your way in our lives. And as we sing this last song and we prepare to leave, I ask that you would watch over everybody that's with us on live stream as they go about their business. Lord, I pray that you'll be with everybody that's here and help them to move out and do what they need to do and honor you with their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with us if you would. We're going to talk about how great our God is. That's what we need to know in times like this, isn't it? How great our God is. He's greater than our government. He's greater than anything we can come up with. He's an awesome and amazing great God. Live stream. We love that. People are still watching even though things are starting to get back to normal. Um, with the new normal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but we're glad that you're here. May God bless you this week. May he watch over you, comfort you, and keep you, and protect you. That's our prayer. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you again next week. Amen. God bless.